So I'm really excited to introduce uh, this afternoon's Physics Colloquium speaker, Professor uh, Nikhil Malvankar. He is an associate professor in the Department of Molecular Biophysics and Chemistry at Yale University. He has been running his lab uh, since uh, 2015. He is what I consider and what many of us consider a good colleague, a good friend of, friend of ours, and also one of the pioneers of uh, measurement of uh, conductive uh, protein nanowires. What is amazing about Nikhil is that he attacked or he tried to understand uh, conductive protein nanowires from multiple angles, starting from physics, cell biology, biochemistry, and even structural biology using cryo EM microscopy. Uh, he started his training as an undergraduate and master student at uh, IIT Mumbai in India. And then he continued his study as a graduate student, a PhD student at uh, uh, University of Massachusetts in Arm Armhurst. So his uh, PhD is in the lab of Mark Tuminen, and he did his uh, postdoc with uh, Professor Derek Lovely. Uh, in his postdoc, he received the prestigious uh, Bureau Welcome Fund Career Award at the Scientific Interface in 2014. And since then, he has been uh, receiving many prestigious awards, uh, such as uh, NSF Career, NIH Directors, uh, New Innovator Award, even teaching awards such as uh, Camille Dreyfus Teacher Scholar Award. And recently he has been awarded uh, Blavatnik Award in Innovation. So uh, Nikhil, uh, we're excited to uh, learn more about you. Please well, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Nika Malvankar. Yeah, thank you so much, Rizal, for that kind introduction. And do you all hear me well? So first, thank you all of you for being here. And I'm truly grateful to Rizal for bringing me here. And, uh, you know, a lot of my heroes are in this audience. Like I started learning a lot of physics from Stuart and studying the mechanism from Dimitri and just being with them and giving a talk in front of them. It's a huge honor for me. And Cesar and I, we started working on this around the same time. And when I was doing measurement, Cesar was using very different method to compute those. And I was just telling him how happy I was when our values agreed. And I thought I'm doing something, you know, correct. So what I'm going to do today is uh, try to give a brief introduction on this uh, main focus of my lab is to understand how both environmentally important and clinically important microbes can survive without anything like oxygen which is soluble, membrane ingestible. So like in all our case, when we uh, break down our food, we create protons and electrons. Proton makes you know ATP and energy. And electron is a byproduct we all need to get rid of. But these microbes live, live in an environment where uh, they don't have anything like oxygen to get rid of those electrons, uh, where in our case, oxygen can bind to the hemoglobin and take those electrons. So the question I'm really interested in, how can they still keep breathing without anything like um, oxygen? And I'm gonna mainly talk about this one thing which we call protein nanowires and how do they use these protein nanowires to keep breathing without anything like oxygen. And as uh, uh, Rizal mentioned, I'm gonna start with the atomic structures we saw with the hope of understanding functions, how bacteria use them and how electrons you know, move, move between them. So a lot of focus today gonna to be on this natural protein nanowire, where we have found that uh, either the stacked arrangement of heme molecule, just like hemoglobin or aromatic amino acid in some cases can allow this bacteria to export electrons. Um, another interest of mine is uh, atomic force microscopy. And I will show you some, uh, some of our efforts to image electrons in this bacteria using this technique and also mechanical forces with the final goal is can we reconstitute this system in other bacteria? I will show our efforts on designing simpler system to understand this mechanism, but also translating those into uh, other system. So this work is you know, very interdisciplinary. So 
please don't hesitate to you know uh, interrupt me anytime and i promise you that i won't go beyond you know the one hour time so i don't have to present all the slides we can have you know stop but uh, please interrupt me if something is not clear so uh, let me reiterate the, the main reason why this factory are need these wires because like in our case oxygen can go all the way inside the cell bind to the hemoglobin the heme is storing the electron you know it's going through the blood and that's the reason why we breathe but because these bacteria have nothing which they can inhale the only way they can breathe is basically getting the electrons out so i like to think of them like a snorkel if you have done ever snorkeling where you are deep in the water and you have this long snorkel so that you can keep breathing this is similar to that where they use these wires and they are typically few nanometers wide so here i'm showing you an image of a bacteria with these filaments coming out and filament can be several micrometer long and couple of things you know we still don't understand where today i bothered dimitri a lot to help me understand this is a uh, the rates we measure in these hemes are uh, something we cannot explain with you know the gold standard theory we have for electron transfer so we get this ultra fast rates within 100 femtosecond and also distances of like 10000 times size of back so this bacteria can transfer electron over a very long distance so uh, there are three points i want to convey today that the bacteria actually use this electronic sport so that they can switch their metabolism to a fast growing metabolism and that can allows them to outcompete all other bacteria grow really fast and you know colonize different surfaces bacteria make these nanowires typically only under certain conditions so they make more of these nanowire when they sense that there is an electron acceptor present and there is an electric field present <coughs> excuse me <coughs> and this has allowed us to electronically control the gene expression in the laboratory where we can apply a small voltage and we can control the gene expression so my hope is to convince you you know at the end of this talk today that this electron conducting protein and this electrogenetics maybe one day can we can use as an electronic analog of green fluorescent protein and optogenetics so just like how we use light to control eukaryotic cell maybe one day we can use electrons to control bacteria <laughs> excuse me So these nanowires were discovered more than 20 years ago in the lab of my former postdoc advisor, Derek Lovely, where they grew this bacteria under a condition where they were growing with mineral like iron oxide. And they found that bacteria started making filaments only under this growth condition. And then later, uh, we found that this bacteria can also make electricity. So you can grow them on a, on a, on a, fuel cell where the bacteria is growing on this uh, area called anode and they form this biofilm and then you can monitor their growth curve like just by measuring the electric current and when they don't have this nanowire they don't make the make the current and my early work was focusing on really the in situ measurement of measuring the electron conductivity of the biofilm the same time when Cesar was measuring it uh, with the uh, very complementary method using electrochemistry. And what was surprising to us that time that we were getting a very high uh, values of electron conductivity comparable to conducting polymer. And when we uh, separated these filaments from the bacteria and just measure their conductivity, we also got uh, you know similar values, which was suggesting that this conductivity is sufficient to account for electron flow in this biofilm. But proteins are, you know, not known to transfer electron this fast. And for the last 20 years, it was thought that these nanowires are primarily made up of a protein called pili. So in Latin, pili means hair. And from the images, they, they do look like bacteria's hair. <coughs> and uh, all the genetic data suggested that, you know, these pili proteins are involved. And it was not known that the cytochrome molecule can form filament. So the entire field, including me, we all thought that 
these nanowires are made up of this pillar protein. So for this talk, I'm gonna focus on, you know, three key questions. The first is how do bacteria, you know, make this wire, how do they assemble these wires and then use this wire. And I'm gonna focus on two different protein. The second part is a, a really key question is how do electrons get to the wire? So it's not sufficient to have a wire outside. Somehow bacteria has to connect it through the inside the metabolism. And that's still a very active area of research. And finally, can we now use these wires to electronically control behavior of bacteria? Can we use different physical and chemical stimuli to change not just the conductivity of the wire, but also the bacterial growth rate using the wire? <coughs> so uh, let me start with the first part that why do they even need the wire? So um, um, if you calculate how much area these bacteria need just to gain enough energy so that they can replicate, because their electrons and protons are decoupled, they just need a much larger area, almost 25 times area. And if we do some you know, simple calculation to compute how many electrons they need just to gain their enough energy to replicate, they need to basically transport almost 10 million electrons per second. So that means we need you know, two properties, right? First, we need this 25 times area. So we need very long wires. And the second, they need to be conductive enough so that they can move this 10 million electron per second. So for a long time in the field, the question was, how can that happen? How can a protein you know, do achieve both those things? And this is where uh, cryo-electron microscopy came to our rescue. So my student Yangshi worked like three years to get perfect images of this filament. And then we collaborated with uh, Ada Gelman who was working with Lord Hockbaum at that time to solve the structure. And what we found is these wires are just like your phone charger. So the hemes in the wire is your, uh, the hemes are like a wire and protein just wraps around it like an insulation. And that allows them to work in you know, many different environments. And the hemes in this wire are very, very close to each other. So they are within like almost a Van der Waal distance, like three and a half angstrom. So they're like perfect stack. And that can allow electrons to move really fast. So the arrangement is very, very different than hemoglobin, where all the hemes are on the surface. So oxygen can bind to hemoglobin hemes. Whereas here, electrons are moving from the center of the wire. So one of the first experiments we did to understand that now we have a structure like this. How can electrons go from one end to other end? Because typically in biology, when electrons move, they use different proteins because each have a different potential so that electrons go from high energy to low energy, whereas here they all were made up of the same protein. So the method we use is a, a conductive probe, atomic force microscopy. So we use like a part of a gold electron and part of an insulator like silicon dioxide. And we put a filament in such a way that partly it's on an electrode and partly on a non-conductive surface. And then we can we can measure current at different uh, distances and <coughs> plot the current as a function of a voltage. And then we can plot resistance as a function of a nanowire layer. And this tells us, you know, what is the contact resistance because the slope and the y-intercept tells us how much resistance we have to inject electron. And then lane dependence can teach us about you know, how the electrons are moving in the system. So we use a very simple model in this first publication to compute how much current is flowing as a function of the rate, which is the k-hop. n is the number of step. And this exponential is like a decay parameter, like how electrons are decaying over time. And when we feed this to our data, we found something surprising. The first was, the rate was very, very high, 10 to the 10 per second, whereas in most proteins, rates are 10 to the six or 10 to the seven. And this decay parameter alpha was basically close to zero. And what does that mean is somehow electrons are moving along this wire. <coughs> I'm really sorry, I think I ate something. And, uh, that, that rate is basically uh, going in such a, such a way that 
the electron is just not decaying at all. So there is an ultra low attenuation. So this was very surprising to us that how can electrons move in a wire with basically no decay? And we use a technique called a spectroelectrochemistry. So in this technique, we basically shine uh, ultraviolet light through an electrode of a solution of our wire. And then we apply a voltage to the electrode so that we can fully oxidize the wire. So there are no electrons. And then we can reduce it so that we are filling up with electron. And we collect a spectra and we plot our data as oxidized fraction as a function of different voltages. And this is a very useful technique because you can fit an equation to that data and you can actually compute what are the potentials of the hemes in the system. And that's where we found that all these potentials are very, very close to each other. So they are within 50 to 100 millivolts from each other. And what does that mean is there is no large barrier for electron to go from one heme to another. Like if you compare this with other uh, proteins of the other bacteria, those can be like 300, 350, 400 millivolt. Whereas here the barrier was very, very small. We also did this experiment on a surface. So first we're only in solution, but these bacteria grow on surfaces. Electrons are not soluble. So the wires need to bind to our surfaces. So we, when we did measurement on a surface, we got similar values. So that gave us confidence that the values we are doing, measuring are mean, biologically meaningful. And that could explain how can they move electron over uh, such a long distance. So now the next question is, okay, now we know that they are moving electron. How do bacteria make these wires? Because it looks like a very complicated machinery. So my, stu my microbiology student, Song Shen, he discovered that it actually has a gene cluster. So around 10 genes are present and they form the gene cluster and that present in many, many different bacteria. And he <coughs> went through this laborious work of deleting each and every gene to find out what these wires are doing. And he found out that each of these protein has a very unique role. So the first protein which he named OSCH is a protein which properly folds this nanowire. So it holds them and makes sure it's correctly oriented. The second set of proteins are like a, like a channel that allows these proteins to come out of the system. The third protein is in, involved in ma ma maintaining that it only comes out as a one wire, not a bundle of wire. And if we change its expression, we can force them to aggregate and form cable. But last is my favorite protein, where what we found is, if we increase the expression of that protein, we can trick this bacteria to make wires very, very fast. And that protein actually looks like a very boring protein, just like a, a ring protein. So we couldn't understand why having more of those rings will give us you know, more of these wires. So luckily we were able to make this protein uh, outside the bacteria, reconstitute it. And using a technique called uh, size exclusion chromatography, we were able to purify and see that it, it forms the monomer as expected, but it also forms this ring structure, a multimal structure. And using a technique called native mass spectrometry, we were able to confirm that it primarily forms octomers. So it forms eight rings typically. And when we image that, yeah, it does look like a ring. And then we use alpha fold to model that protein. And this is where we found that it actually has a, a ATP binding motif called DAD motif. So the idea is, is it an ATP driven motor? And basically bacteria use them under certain condition where they can use this motor to make more, uh, more wires. So the experiment we did is a fluorescent spectroscopy experiment. And the way this experiment work is you look at your protein. If, if the ATP is binding to that protein, there is a blue shift and an increase in the fluorescent intensity. So those are the two signatures that if ATP is binding to your protein of interest, you will see both those changes. And that's exactly my student found that when they, when ATP binds, 
you see those blue shift and the increase in fluorescent intensity. And to confirm that it is a very specific binding, he added an another ATP, which is not fluorescent, so that it can displace the, the bound ATP. And then the intensity goes down and it, it goes back to our age shift. And that's what he noticed from his data. So this is a really exciting finding for us because it suggests that you know one of these proteins can actually act as a motor and we can control how many wires we can make in this protein. And this is a hypothesis we are really interested in testing uh, testing further. The next thing I want to tell you about is a biofilm. So these bacteria never live alone. They always like to live in a community. So they form these very thick biofilm. And I like to think of them like a high rise apartment complex. So they are like 100 floor you know, tall and the bacteria who's living on the 100th floor can still transfer electron all the way to the bottom. And this is what attracted me to this problem in the first place. That I'm a human, I'm like a one meter. I cannot breathe oxygen, which is 100 meters away from me, but bacteria are breathing, you know, their oxygen or their electron acceptor, which is 100 times away their size. And we realized that we can use this method to get more and more nanowires because under this condition, they have to make wires. That's the only way they can survive to get electrons over 100 times. And, and if you look at them, uh, they look very red in the color. Same reason why our blood looks red, because they are just filled with this thin, thin protein. So using the same method I showed you earlier, this conducting probe, atomic force microscopy, when we did the measurement on this wire, we found that in this biofilm cell, they make a completely different protein called OMCZ, and it has a thousand times higher conductivity than the earlier protein I showed you. So that was very surprising that why are they making two wires, you know, let alone one? And even if they are making two wires, why they have such a high, you know, different conductivity? So we didn't understand, you know, why the conductivity is higher. So it took us, you know, three years to solve its atomic structure and found we found that the structure is very, very different. So now all the hymns are in a perfectly straight line and they are much closely packed, much closely stacked with each other. And we think that could be a part of the reason why it has a higher conductivity. And my student has recently found that in most bacteria, these wires are mutually exclusive. So just by pure coincidence, the bacteria we were using was making both the wires. But in most cases, they either make one or the other wire. So we found that most archaea makes OMCZ wire, whereas most bacteria make OMCS wire. So we were able to find that whole gene cluster for this wire in this bacteria. So that means they do have a different purpose and the species either make one or the other, other wire. So I'm gonna tell you in a minute that this wire is assembled very differently. So the previous you know, OMCS wire needed that gigantic 10 gene cluster. <coughs> Here we find that it just a uh, couple of genes are enough to make this. So it just basically the, the, the red is the, the gene which makes our nanowire protein and the yellow is another protein called OZPA, which is an isomerase protein, which basically folds the, actually I did a typo. It's a serine protease protein. And the way it works is it has a, a sugar binding domain shown in purple and that OZPA basically chops that protein into two and then the remaining part can just polymerize. And it has a very unique, this uh, an RNA part, which looks like a transfer RNA. And we think that's really the key in controlling how bacteria is gonna make the wire. So just to summarize that, this wire is much different and in some way very easy to make. So we have been able to put this in E. coli, are able to make them artificially. So whereas we just take this protein and then we just add the pink part uh, outside and we can just force this protein to polymerize. And we, we hope that we can use that to study this in more. So why this protein is so exciting to us? Because we just recently found that many archaea, which are very important in controlling methane to the atmosphere, they show the genes, you know, 
uh, of this of this protein. So this is a picture of my, by my colleague Jill Banfield from Berkeley, where they found that this archaea at the bottom of the ocean, they make this giant extra chromosomal element, which she called in Borgs, you know, for a matrix movie like cyborgs. And these back these archaea are very important because they protect us from all the methane released from the ocean. So if these microbes stop working, basically Earth will become like Mars and we all will die. So they are really important microbe. And <clears throat> understanding how do they do that might help us to you know, reduce global warming by reducing the methane in the atmosphere. And my student song was able to you know, work with the Banfield group to identify that these OMCG nanowire are present in many of these archaea and even on those Borg elements. So now we are studying how, how do they use this element to exchange these wires from uh, each other. So this is all about you know, how bacteria make this wire. Now I want to switch to a question which I really don't fully understand is why they, there is such a high you know, difference in conductivity in the measurement. And I'm an experimentalist. So my first question always to my student is, how do we know our measurements are correct? You know, are we doing something wrong or different? And could that be responsible? So let me tell you in a minute how we do the measurement and how we, you know, ensure that this is not an artifact. So the method we use is we grow first bacteria under conditions where it makes a lot of this filament. And then we basically give them a haircut. So we basically actually put them in a blender, you know, and we collect all their hairs and we purify them with many different methods. But once we get a pure protein, we put them on a device with a multiple electrode so that only a one wire is across a four electrode so that we can connect them. And we make sure that, you know, uh, this is very different than a typical two electrode method where contact resistance dominant. So here we can measure you know, without those contact effects because current only flow, flows through the outer circuit and not the inner circuit. But this is where we can do measurement in a fully hydrated condition. Whereas you can keep the buffer on the top and we can do the measurement. So first we you know, published this measurement in 2019 and we got currents of like you know, 30 picoam around 100 millivolt for this 300 nanometer filament. And this is a picture I'm showing you of two electrodes with the filament bridging. Then my another student did the same measurement using different buffer, different electrogeometry, and different person, but he also got a very similar value. Again, 30 picoam for current. And then we compare those with our AFM measurement, where we air dry so that there is still a water layer, but they are not fully hydrated, like electrode. Again, we get this exact same value. So we at least know that it's not the effect of tape pressing the wire or some dehydration, it's something intrinsic the way this wire sit on an electrode. And I just learned from Damitri today that just wire sitting on an electrode is also a part of dehydration. So even that could be important. And the same thing we see for the Z filament. So these are the measurements I had done a you know, long time ago uh, with my another student and the, the, the measurements on the other side are the a atomic force microscopy measurement. And again, we get a very similar current at a similar voltage. So that really gives me a confidence that these measurements are at least consistent across different setup, different you know, environment. But the, the values, uh, we don't explain. So, so I hired a computational chemist who worked with me like for four years. And he, he tried to calculate you know, with, the, with the theory we have. And with all the methods he used, the value was always billion fold lower for OMCS and a billion fold lower for OMCZ. And I'm not a theorist, so I need Damitri to you know, tell me uh, what, what goes into all these models. But this is something, you know, is a really exciting that some, some interesting physics is happening here, which we don't fully explain. So I'm gonna tell you just a couple of things which we think are important. Something we do as an experiment list, but we don't always incorporate them in the model. Is first is each of these molecules has a very different geometry. And we think that they can pack electrons very differently. And I'm going to show you some data which shows that the 
the electron density is very different in the system. The second is I'm going to show you a measurement using a technique called a transient absorption spectroscope. And that gives us rates of like 100 femtosecond, whereas the computation gives rates like millisecond to nanosecond. So we know that there is a mismatch between the rates we are measuring and the rates we are computing. And final part, which I don't you know, understand fully, is there are a uh, few groups which think that we need to invoke, invoke some quantum mechanical effect, take into account molecular vibration or a coherence effect. And that's something as an experiment is I would love to know how can I probe them uh, directly. So let me tell you the first method we use. Again, this is the version of atomic force microscopy. But what we do here is we basically park our tip at one point, apply a voltage, you know, for like two seconds, and we just put electron at one point in this wire. And then we go at other location and measure how many electrons are distributed in the wire. And that allows us to basically compute how many electrons are pack packed in the wire. And when we compare that for a monomer versus filament versus this OMCZ, we do get a large differences. So as expected, when you go from a monomer to filament, we get a higher density because now there is a partner heme at the edge. But then once we go to OMCZ, we get a over 100 times higher density. And this is something we can explain just by the packing density or geometry of our heme. Because we have eight hemes for like a three nanometer in OMCZ versus we have six heme over five nanometer in OMCS. So that something can partly explain the different con conductivity. And the second part is the way we do measurement here is we use like two pulses. One is called a pump pulse where we excite the electron from a ground state to excited state. And then we use a probe pulse to figure out how fast electron is coming back. And this is the actual data where the green is the, the initial pulse where the electrons are oxidized. And then we see this intermediate pulse called the blue pulse, which we think is a, a doubly oxidized heme where we are taking electron out. And the red is electron going back to a neighboring heme. And these are some measurements we are actively doing now with a group in Argon. And the top is actually the schematic measurement what we think would be happening where we excite the electron and then it goes to a neighboring heme and then eventually it relaxes. And now we can fit different rate constant to the data. And we do see the rates are around 100 to 300 femtosecond between the heme. So that's something we need to be able to explain uh, you know, uh, computational and that's something we are working on. And this is just to give an idea how other people are trying to explain our data. There are a couple of groups who have invoked some quantum mechanical effect based on the coherence. And by simple-minded understanding of you know, the Marcus theory is, it's very powerful theory where we are collapsing all molecular arrangement and vibration into a single thermodynamic parameter called this reorganization energy. And in some cases, you need to improve that description of these molecular vibrations and reorganization. And I hope uh, you know people like Dimitri can you know, figure out how to uh, improve that part. Uh, now I'm going to switch gear and talk about how do electrons even get to the wire. And that's, you know, a really long-standing question because uh, just having a wire outside is not enough if you cannot, you know, get electrons from inside to the outside. And if you compare, you know, the rates published in the literature, the, the, the most, you know, electron-carrying molecule at best can move electron like 10 to the 5, you know, electrons per second. Whereas a typical rate we get is higher than like a million electrons per second. So how to reconcile, you know, these two different models. And what we are realizing is that depending on the growth condition, these bacteria use very, very different strategies. So I'm gonna quickly show you uh, three strategies which we are working on. The first is, you know, we think that the, if this nanowire can somehow grow all the way in the periplasm, then the, the, the the cytochromes in the periplasm can just bind it and move the electron. The second is maybe this, uh, there are some nanowires formed inside the bacteria and that can also allow them to move electron. And the finally, we found some structures which we call cytochrome nanotubes and we think they could be involved in 
So about the transferring electrons. So let me quickly show you the first part. So what we found here is the charge of the OMCS is very negative. And there is this protein called PPC or periplasmic cytochrome, which are mainly positively charged. And my colleague uh, from Portugal, Carlos Silguera, they helped us with NMR to quantify the electron transfer rate between these and also to find out can these two proteins bind to each other? So which residues are actually binding to each other? And they were able to identify those residues and they're also able to compute the electron inject, injection rate. And that come out of a very simple model that if these nanovirus can go all the way to the periplasm, then any of these monomeric cytochrome can just bind to them. And because they can just bind, you don't have to worry about electron diffusing you know, from one monomeric cytochrome to another, and you can solve the problem in that in that one way. So this could be one strategy, but uh, and this is just a model to show you. If you just dock this to protein, you have a pathway for electrons to move. But what we found is when bacteria grow under different conditions, they produce very different protein. So under one condition, we found that some of these proteins can actually form filaments in the periplasm. And when we looked at them, you know, with the imaging, we were able to see that they also have a similar conductivity as these uh, other cytochrome. And that could be another way where they can wire the inner and outer membrane <laughs> just with this wire. And, you know, I think in the future, we need help from tomography, like what Cesar is doing, to really visualize this system more carefully. And the third model I'm going to show you is uh, my student, Joey Arabin, he was able to purify one of this protein, which called a porin cytochrome protein. So it basically, porin is like a hole, like a beta barrel protein. And then there are these other two cytochrome. And he was able to purify and compare its structure uh, with alpha fold model using circular dichroism. And it was a very uh, similar structure. And <laughs> what we found is this protein works with another protein called MACA, and this MACA actually forms these giant tubes in the structure. So this is a, a, a cryo-electron microscopy structure we saw for this tube, and it's this is a really giant tube, a 35 nanometer tube, and uh, we are working on understanding how do the bacteria work together. They have this continuous path for the heme molecule. So the currently the model we are testing is can this MACA tube just directly bind to those uh, or in cytochrome protein to move electron, there are potentials to line up, but that doesn't mean the electrons are actually moving. And again, this is where I think the tomography would be really powerful to, to look at that. But there is a, another interesting thing we obs observed is this protein also packs DNA. So uh, you, <coughs> you might be aware that many viruses actually package their DNA when they cause infection. So what? So this is a picture of a virus, viral capsid. And they have these proteins, which has DNA inside it. So here it is a DNA, and that just the positive charge around the protein. And this is very important for viruses because they can protect and package their genome, and they can then insert them when they cause infection. And we see something very similar with our these cytochrome tubes. So now we are testing the hypothesis that. Are they also packaging and protecting the genome? And are these proteins working as a peroxidase to protect the genome? But there is another possibility which I'm interested in is uh, there is a hypothesis proposed by Jackie Barton from Caltech that these metalloproteins can bind to a DNA and repair the damage base. So many times, you know, you, we get like cancer and all, uh, like a skin cancer, because when a, we use sunscreens, and this is because the sunlight can damage and oxidize one of the base in the DNA. And the way uh, Barton group proposed it can repair it is by sending the electron, uh, sending the electron to oxidize the base. And I know this was a very controversial model, uh, but in our case, because the metalloprotein wraps all around the DNA, we think that the electron can just has to go laterally. It doesn't have to go along the DNA and it can repair the base. And we are now testing that um, possibility. And in uh, last few minutes, I wanna tell you about 
our efforts to really understand you know, what's the mechanism of conductivity, but can we really use these wires to control the growth of the bacteria? And I'm gonna mainly focus on the unpublished result, but in the past we have been able to use temperature. And typically when you cool things, you know, everything slows down and freezes down. We saw like a 300 times increase in conductivity. And I'm hoping one day the metric can explain us why that is happening. We also shine light on them, which I showed you earlier, where we can photo excite an electron moves so fast between the heme. We see like a hundred times increase in conductivity. But today I'm gonna to focus on some new thing we have found. What is the effect of humidity? So, you know, when bacteria are using this wire, the humidity is hundred percent. But just to understand the mechanism, we decide to change humidity. And we found that there's a 30, 30,000 times increase in conductivity. And I'm also gonna talk about, you know, how a magnetic field could be affecting their conductivity. So the way do, we do measurement is like a gold standard to measure conductivity called a Van der Poel device. We, we have like a four pads and we make a film. So we can do this four electrode measurement on a film and we can apply a voltage from the bottom. So this is like a transistor and we can call something called a gate, gate effect. So this is a very complementary, you know, what uh, ASU had developed with um, in Tau group is the top conductance, molecular conductance, where this is more back gating or a, you are changing the conductance. And you see there are two profiles. In one case with positive voltage, conductance increasing. In other case with negative voltage, conductance is increasing. So it's telling you, you have two different kinds of charge carrier. One is more you know, electron-like and one is more proton or a hole-like. And using this, we can directly compute how fast electrons are moving in the system, which is called mobility. And we can plot that mobility as a function of the humidity of the system. And what we found is both of them have a very similar value. And so the, the blue and the purple and pink, they both show a very similar value. And as you change the mobility or uh, humidity from 20 to 70, the mobility also changes dramatically. And this is also dependent on the nature of water. So if you change water to something heavier, like you know, deuterium, then they move much slowly. So clearly the water is playing a role. So to understand the mechanism, we did measurement as a function of temperature. And that allows us to calculate something called activation energy, the slope of this curve. And we found that it affects you know, both electrons and protons. And when you cool them, it actually stabilizes the network and we get much lower activity. So here our model is, we also need to look into protons when, when we are looking into electron. And protons typically move by a mechanism called this Grothus mechanism. So there is basically there is a bond which is changing. And if you look at how, as electrons are moving, the proton is also moving, which I'm showing you here on the top. So they are also moving around the ring. And what we think is they both have to move together so that electron doesn't become polarized and doesn't get stuck at one point. So only the proteins which have a, a very good part to move electrons and protons together, they can only show the high conductivity. And that's why we see only in this one system, we get this really high conductivity. And this can show, show some, some other interesting effect. So a few years ago, there was a report that if you take these wires and put under a uh, electrode and change humidity, you can generate electricity. And it created a lot of interest. Now, uh, many devices have been built using that. And a few challenges with this work was, it wasn't clear what exactly the nanowires are made up of, what protein they were using, and what's the exact mechanism. But now with this humidity effect, we can explain this very simply. So we can purify the wire. So this one band you see means we have only one protein in our sample, and we can do the same measurement with that device and show that we can actually generate power from these aside from Y. And this same humidity change is creating that gradient and that's allowing us to generate the power. And the, the last thing I wanna tell you is <coughs> something I don't fully understand, but uh, I hope you, you will appreciate that how, um, unique the systems are that if you apply a very small magnetic field 
they show this very large increase in conductance. So what we are doing here is, we again use a conducting probe, atomic force microscope, and we put this filament on a gold electrode, and we use a conducting tip and measure at different point, and we collect like, you know, hundreds of measurement. So we generate a conductance histogram, and by doing analysis, we can compute how much conductance is for different fields. And we saw that there is a very large increase in conductance over 25,000 fold when we apply a very small field like half of Tesla. And there was a big difference whether the field is up and down. And we did a lot of control experiment. So we use proteins which don't have hemes. We chemically reduced hemes like, and in none of the condition we saw this effect, only in one condition we saw this effect. So this is to show you first effect is, if you chemically reduce the heme, then the magnetic field doesn't change the conductance at all. So the heme needs to be oxidized in order to see this effect. Then, but if you just compare the, uh, how much conductance is changing, the, the ox oxidized heme with the magnetic field is showing similar effect as the, uh, the reduced heme by itself. But then once it reduces, it doesn't show much change in the conductance. So we don't see any change in the spin polarization, whether the field is up or down, we don't see any change in the conductance. But if you have oxidized heme, there is a big difference between spin up and spin down. So if you convert that into spin polarization, there is almost 99% uh, polarization, like all spins are you know, oriented in one direction in the system. So then we did another experiment where we used the nickel electrode instead of gold, and nickel because then we can polarize all the spin by applying a magnetic field. And in that case, we didn't see any effect at all. So there was almost no change in conductance. And it basically remains close to one in both, uh, both cases. So uh, there is a you know one model which uh, many people are studying is called a chirality induced spin selectivity. And it's a beautiful model where if you have a chiral protein um, and if electron is filling this chiral potential, that can align their spin up and down. And many groups have done the experiment, a lot of theoretical work done here at ASU. But in that case, they always need a nickel electrode to you know, inject spin polarized uh, electron. And also there is not much difference between spin up and spin down. And the, typically the effects happen at very high volume. So at, at this stage, we are not able to explain our effect with this well-known chirality induced spin selectivity effect because this effect you know, primarily happens at high bias, whereas we are seeing all our effects at the low bias. So we use another technique called a Kelvin probe force microscopy. And what this method does is, it can tell you what's the energy of electron on your system. So what it does is, it compares like two different materials and it compares first their energy level with respect to a reference length. And this is a very powerful technique because you can get something called a work function, like how much energy you need to remove the electron. And when we put our bias on electron, yeah. when we oxidize and reduce them, we see a big color change. And that can tell us you know, how the electron energy is changing. And we can easily explain that with a simple energy level diagram that this is the potential of the wires as we change the voltage of a gold electron, either we are putting electron or we are removing electron. That's why we see the color change. And when we do the same thing with the magnetic field, we see a very similar effect. So when we uh, apply a magnetic field, we also see a color change. So somehow magnetic field is behaving very similar. And it's also basically pushing electron to a higher energy level. And this is something we can see this quantity called contact potential difference, which is a proxy for uh, um, work function. So I have a very simple model to you know present to you what we think is happening. So we think that when uh, these wires are oxidized where there are no electrons and there is no magnetic field, when you put the electron, they can easily go to the lowest energy state, spin up or spin down. But when you reduce the heme, and that, that once the electron goes, the heme state reduces. Now, if you start with the reduced heme, or if you start with you know heme with the magnetic field, in both cases, 
the injected electron cannot go to the lower state because in the case of radio stream, this state is completely filled. In the case of magnetic field, the field is aligning your electron. So electron just cannot go to the lowest state. It has to go to a higher state. And that's what we are thinking could be responsible for increasing the conductance. And there are uh, some studies with a single molecule measurement by other groups where they have shown that uh, when you have reduced these ion porphyrin, you don't see a magneto resistance. And they also found that depending on whether the material is a low atomic number, whether you get a strong spin orbitic uh, spin orbit coupling, that decides what the uh, conductance is. So this is something I'm really looking forward to discussing with you know people like Josh and other. How can we really understand this measurement in greater detail? But with that, I hope I convince you that you know these uh, bacteria and their wires are very interesting. The the bacteria make them as a part of their survival, and depending on the electric field, they decide whether to make low or high conductive wires. You can tune this conductivity by different stimuli, and that way you can control the growth of the bacteria. And uh, it's not just the one bacteria which makes this wire. There are many different bacteria and archaea, which are important for our environment, and some even infectious micro, they use these wires for survival and the growth. With that, I want to thank all the students who did the work. A lot of this work was started by undergraduate students. They, they were really bold to you know, try some of these uh, risky experiments. Now many of them have gone to bigger and better things. And this work is very interdisciplinary. So when I started my lab, I had to learn a lot of biochemistry, structural biology, molecular microbiology. And then with students from biophysical chemistry and computation, they all work together. And these are all my collaborators and funding agencies. Thank you very much.